Richard, your book, uh, The Ancestor's Tale, uh, tells the story of life on Earth, and it does it in the reverse way that the tree of life is normally expressed. Normally we say, what was the, f what did life start out? How did it start? One cell, multiple cells and growing up. And you've done that in reverse. You've started where we are and tracing it all back. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful um, pedagogical tool and analysis, but it, it, I, I'd love to hear your sense of the, of the tree of life, the importance of that, and how in, in either direction, it helps us understand life on earth. There is one tree of life uh, in, we pretty much know that because every creature that's ever been looked at has the same genetic code. So there must be a common ancestor. There may have been alternative forms of life, but they've died out probably being eaten by bacteria, <laughs> so where any, Darwin suggested. Um, so yes, there is one single tree of life, one single pedigree. And if you start from the beginning, then it's a branching, branching, branching tree, and it ends up with literally millions mm. of, of twigs at the, at the end, many of them extinct. Um, and if you go forwards in time, then there's a natural tendency to be interested in the human story, to end up with humans. And that leads to the unfortunate temptation to think of the whole thing as being directed towards humans, uh, uh. Which, is a, which is a sin. Um, and so... What, it's not only wrong, it's a sin. <laughs> yes. Um, what um, Yan Wong, my co-author, and I decided to do was to acknowledge that people are interested in humans. But to start... So we could have started at any point in this gigantic tree and worked backwards towards the origin of life. We could have started with a cockroach and, and gone backwards. But we are human, so we started with, with, with humans. And the idea was to have a pilgrimage, a, a, a Chaucerian <laughs> pilgrimage, where we would set off from the present in search of our ancestors. And we would be joined by our cousins, who are also setting off from their various starting points. So six, six or seven million years into the past, we would be joined by our chimpanzee cousins who themselves making their own pilgrimage. And then mm -hmm. another couple of million years after that, we'd be joined by our gorilla cousins <laughs> and so on. And the slightly surprising thing is that if you do it that way, there are only about 30 junction points. Um, oh. because, because, for example, Virtually all the invertebrates join at one at one point. Um, not all, and that's not quite true. I mean, mollusks and and annelid worms and arthropods, mm. um, and various others, all join our pilgrimage at, at one point. Mm. Um, so there are only about thirty of these junction points. We call them concestors, um, and that way you get in a sort of in a manageable kind of way you can work your way back to the origin mm. of the whole thing. And we also put in, as Chaucer did, tales. Our, our pilgrims told tales, which were um, bits of biological interest, things of, of interest that were appropriate to talk about in when this particular cousin joined us. So the grasshopper's tale was about race, for example, <laughs> and, and there's other, lots and lots of tales. And um, well, that, that's the book. It's a very long book. It's, oh, it's a very big tree. It's a very big tree, <laughs> yes. Uh, and molecular biology has been enormously important in confirming and, 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 and refining uh, to, um, in a very um, fine-grained manner, how those branches work. Yes. Uh, it, it's amazing what a lot more we know because of molecular taxonomy. Mm. Yes. And now the tree of life preceded molecular biology, obviously. Uh, but um, has molecular biology made any differences? Were there, were there branches in the tree that molecular biology changed because you now have this fine-grained approach? Yes, I mean, the, the one, my favorite one that I'm often quoting is, is the astonishing re revelation that whales uh, spring from the middle of the cloven-hoofed animals. Um, so it's not just that they are related side, you know, to one side of the cloven-hoofed animals, they're right in the middle of the cloven-hoofed mm. animals. Um, their closest relatives are hippos. Um, and um, I'd always thought when I was an undergraduate, we were taught that 
hippos and pigs were closely related, yeah. but actually hippos and whales are closely yeah, related. Yeah, that, that's amazing. And um, that's the most extreme example I know of, of where molecular taxonomy has And now that you up. know that, how can you then reinterpret uh, the, uh, the, the, the development of whales or hip, hippos? And well, um, th there is a very good fossil record of whales, and, and, uh, um, but, but it doesn't... There, there were sort of indications of, of relationships to the artiodactyls, the even told ungulates, but it, it, it wasn't certain. And certainly the relationship to hippos was not, was not known. Yeah. And the, the fact that you now have that, can, does, it, does it change the nature of how you think about m literally the intermediary species that had to be there? Yes. Uh, um, I think it makes you lose confidence in, in <laughs> anything other than molecular taxonomy, because if, if, yeah. if you could suddenly have your ideas totally mm. turned upside down in that way, mm. then who knows what <laughs> weird things might turn up. Yeah, but that, that's very good. So that, that, that uh, the, the, da the danger of assuming if you don't have the molecular biology, you're always at some kind of, uh, uh, you're, you're, at, you're a hostage to the fate of molecular yes. biology. On the whole, actually, molecular taxonomy has borne out what, what we already mm. thought mm. from morphology.